this morning. We continue our worship on this Sunday before Christmas as we celebrate Christmas. Now, I know, I know how people are. You've been taking bets out there. Last week he did, he said he was preaching uh, Christmas from the Old Testament, and this week it would be Christmas from the New Testament. I wonder what passage of Scripture Dr. Allen will take today. Will he go to the Gospel of Luke and read the famous Christmas story there? Or will he go maybe to Matthew and read the part of the Christmas story there early in Matthew's Gospel? Or will he go to the Gospel of John chapter 1 and tell us about the Word became flesh and dwelt among us? I wonder which of those texts that he will preach. None of them. In fact, I'm going to preach a text that I bet most of you have never heard preached as a Christmas sermon. And it is found in Hebrews chapter 2. Find the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. Go to the book of Hebrews. Or if you can't find Hebrews, go to James and turn left and you'll be in Hebrews right there. Hebrews chapter 2 and we're going to read verse 6, beginning in verse 6, and to the end of the chapter, because really, this is one of the most amazing Christmas texts, and you will see why when you hear it. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. But someone somewhere has testified. And then the author quotes Psalm 8. What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor. And you subjected everything under his feet. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But as it is, we do not see everything subjected to man. But we do see Jesus, made lower than the angels for a short time, so that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone, crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the source of their salvation, that is Jesus, should make the source of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father." That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. Again, I will trust in him. And again, here I am with the children God gave me. All quotations from the Old Testament. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death that is the devil and free those who are held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death for it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels but rather to help Abraham's offspring therefore he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. For since he himself has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why did God create humanity? Why did God create man? Why did God create people in the first place? It is a fascinating question. And really the most important questions in all of life for every human being is to ask, 
three questions, who am I, why am I here, and where am I going? And those questions are answered in the Bible, and they are answered in the book of Hebrews. Who am I is answered right here in Hebrews chapter 2 as we learn why God created man, why God created people, why God created humanity. In order to make this point, the author quotes a section of the Old Testament Psalms, particularly Psalm 8. And that's why you read in verses 6 through 8 a quotation of Psalm 8. And the very beginning of the quotation, which is in verse 6 of Hebrews 2, is a statement about man's insignificance. Have you ever stopped to think about your insignificance? Well, verse 6 says, What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you care for him? Here is traditional Hebrew Old Testament parallelism. It's poetic language. What is man that you remember him? Or what is the son of man, also people, human beings, that you care for him? Man's insignificance. Human beings insignificance. Think about your human body for just a moment. Have you ever stopped to think about what it's composed of? In fact, let me, I'm going to borrow two men whom I've not asked ahead of time. I'm going to ask two men to come up here and just stand in front of, the, of you. Uh, they won't mind at all when I ask Dr. Biles to do this. And uh, Aaron, Aaron's not going to mind when I ask him to do this. Gentlemen, would you just come and just stand right down here in front of me where everybody can look at you for a moment? Because you are my guinea pigs. You are my illustration. Come on, yeah, come on up here. One on this side and one on, on this side. Let's do that. I want you to come up here. I want to I use you as an illustration today. Did you know that physically the human body is composed of about 99% of only six elements. Did you know that? You're composed of water, the most abundant chemical in the human body. Most of what's in these two men that you see standing up here is actually water. In fact, 65% to 90% of every cell in their bodies is water. Number two, they have some fat in their bodies. They have a percentage of fat which varies from person to person. They have a little bit of fat. Number three, they have some protein. 16% of the mass of their bodies is protein. Look at their hair. All of their hair, that's protein right there. That's protein. Look at their fingernails. Show them your fingernails, gentlemen. That's protein. Look at their skin right there. That epidermis, that's protein. Minerals they also have in their body, 6% of their body is made up of sodium, chlorine, calcium, potassium, and iron. That's what you have. Furthermore, they have carbohydrates, sugar and other carbohydrates, but all of that together only accounts for 1% of their entire body mass. So six elements account for 99% of the mass of the human body. And they are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. 99% of what makes up these two men standing here that you see are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Oxygen is the most abundant element accounting for 65% of their body, a person's mass. Carbon is another 18%. Hydrogen, 10%. Nitrogen, 3.3%. Calcium, 1.5%. And then phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and sodium, each 1% or less, and that's the human body. Did you know that if you remove the water from the human body, take all the water out of their body, remove all the water, do you know the chemical elements that are left in their body? If you sold it on the market, do you know how much they're worth? $17 and some change. That's how much the human body is worth. Take out the water, take the chemicals that are left, and sell it on the market. And you know how much you're worth? 
$17 and roughly 15 cents in change. Did you know if we were to move all of the empty space between the molecules of their body, they would be reduced to a speck of dust that could not even be seen with the unaided eye. The insignificance of the human body. What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you visit him? Well, thank you, gentlemen, for letting me use you as an illustration. And I'm sure you're glad to know that you're worth at least $17 and some change today. But that's not where Psalm 8 ends. Psalm 8 reminds us of our physical insignificance. But then the author of Hebrews quotes a little bit more from Psalm 8. And he teaches us about our significance. Because notice what he says in verse 7. You made man, you made him lower than the angels for a short time you crown him with glory and honor you subjected everything under his feet and so yes physically speaking you might say man is insignificant he's dirt create god created adam from the dust of the ground and god told him from the dust you came and to dust you will return. When you die physically, your physical body goes into the ground. Oh, there's going to be a resurrection though. The Lord Jesus sees to that. But physically speaking, we're pretty insignificant. But then on the other hand, spiritually speaking, we are profoundly significant. You are the crown of God's creation. Everything God made. Everything in the universe, everything about the universe, and then everything on planet Earth and all of the animals and all of the plants and all of the living things, you, as a human being, you are the crown, you are the apex of it all. This is how important you are. This is how valuable to God that you are. Think about yourself for a moment just mentally. If knowledge were measured in inches in 1845, we'd have about one inch worth of knowledge. In 1945, knowledge would have increased to three inches if we're using inches to measure. But from 1945 to 1985, we have expanded to the Washington Monument. And from 1985 to today, there are no buildings large enough to measure it because now we are into the atmosphere way up towards space. And people at IBM tell us that at the rate that we are going, there will come a time where knowledge currently, currently knowledge doubles every 12 months. And IBM technologists, IT specialists tell us we're going to reach a time where knowledge is going to double every 12 hours. That day will come. Every 12 hours. It's utterly amazing, isn't it? The significance of man, the significance of humanity, of people, individually and God has subjected everything verse 8 under his feet for in subjecting everything to him he left nothing that's not subjected to him but notice what else the psalmist says we don't see yet everything subjected to him face a lion on your own a hungry one and see what happens whether he'll be subjected to you or you'll end up subjected to him we don't yet see, because of sin, because of the curse, because of the mess that the world is in, we don't yet see everything subjected to mankind. But the author says, but let me tell you what we do see. Do you see what I see? What we do see, according to verse 9, is Jesus. Jesus, who became one of us. Jesus 
who was, watch it, made lower than the angels. Wait a minute, that's what Psalm 8 just said about humanity. We are just a little lower than the angels in terms of rank, in terms of time. We're just a little bit lower than the angels. We're the crown of human creation, just a little lower than the angels. Well, now, here's what we see. Jesus also, for a short time, made lower than the angels. Why? Why did God create man? And now the question, why did God become man? Why was there a Christmas in the first place? And verse 9 tells you he's made lower than the angels for a short time so that by God's grace he, may, he might taste death for every one. There's your answer as to why God became a man. There's your answer for the incarnation. The word incarnation means to become, to come in the flesh. So God is incarnate. Jesus takes on human flesh. He becomes one of us. That is the point of what happened on the first Christmas. That's why there is a Christmas. There is a Christmas so that Jesus could become one of us. Because unless he becomes one of us, guess what can't be done? He cannot die for your sins unless he becomes your nature, takes on human nature, so that he can die for your sins. That's the point of this text. God loves you and me so much that he created humanity, but then when humanity through Adam and Eve sinned, and rebelled against God, he did not leave us in our sin, but he made it possible for our sins to be forgiven such that God became man and did for us what none of us could do for ourselves. That's Christmas. That's what Christmas is all about. And that's why the author of Hebrews says that Jesus came, look at it, that he might taste death for every one. The word taste there means to fully experience. When Jesus went to the cross, he died. He literally died. He fully experienced death. Furthermore, he did that for. Look at that little word, for. The word is a word in Greek that means substitution. He did it in your place. He tasted death for you. He died in your place as your substitute. And not only that, the extent of that death is stated in that he died for every one. Look at that little word in Greek. Greek for every one. The usage syntactically is an emphasis on each individual person on the planet. Christ died for every single person. There is no person for whom Jesus did not die. There is no one anywhere, no matter who they are, no matter how bad they've been, there is no one anywhere for whom Jesus did not offer an atonement for their sin, making it possible for them to be saved from their sins. That is the true meaning of Christmas. That's what Christmas is all about. And not only that, look at what the author goes on to say. He said, so that he might taste death for every one, verse 9, and then God has crowned him with glory and honor because he suffered death. So now... We are going to see that beginning in verse 10, he can do that because he's related to us. He's one of us. Have you ever used that terminology? Talking about someone and saying, hey, she's one of us, he's one of us. Well, God is saying to you and me today, Jesus is one of us. He became who we are. He remained who he is. He's still God, the eternal God, in the second person of the Trinity. He is God the Son, but he remaining who he is, not divesting himself of his deity and eternality or any of that, but remaining who he is, he became who we are. That's Christmas. That's what Christmas is all about. God became flesh. God became one of us, and he is related to us. Look at verse 10. For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, there are going to be some people saved because of his coming. It was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, God's over everything, God made 
the source of their salvation. Now, who is the source of our salvation? That's Jesus. God made him perfect through suffering. Whoa, whoa, hold the phone. Whoa, time out. Wait a minute. What do you mean Jesus became perfect? I thought Jesus was already perfect, and you're absolutely right. I thought Jesus was perfect in every way. You're absolutely right. Well, then what in the world does the author of Hebrews mean when he tells us that Jesus became a human being, and by virtue of his sufferings, he was perfected? Well, the key is in the word perfected. It is a word that means Jesus was fitted out by his humanity and through his suffering as a human being to fully identify with us and therefore to fully make a perfect sacrifice for our sins. You see, only if Jesus comes in human flesh, only if there is a virgin birth, only if there is a sinless life, only if there is a vicarious substitutionary death on the cross for our sins, only if there is a resurrection, only then could we be saved from our sins. And that's why God became one of us. He identified with us. He is related to us. Notice what is stated there. And then we're going to get a little complicated. Don't let this throw you right here. Verse 11, the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one father. Now, who's the one who sanctifies? That's Jesus. Who are all the ones who are made holy? That would be you and me. And notice we all have one Father, one Heavenly Father, and therefore Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. And then the author quotes three Old Testament passages to identify Jesus with us. Now here's what's fascinating. The author places these quotations on the lips of Jesus, even though in their original Old Testament passage they were not on the lips of Jesus a prophet or a psalmist said these words but you see by virtue of the inspiration of scripture all scripture is not only the word of God it's also the word of Jesus and not only that these are the words of Jesus by virtue of inspiration and so the author chooses three locations here beginning in verse 12 out of the Old Testament Isaiah chapter 8 is one of them Psalm 22 is one of them and notice what Jesus says I will proclaim your name God to my brothers and sisters watch this one I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. Guess who was singing with you today when we were singing in worship to the Heavenly Father? None other than the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this verse says. You said, I was singing to Jesus. Yes, you were. And Jesus was singing with you to the Father. In the, to his praise and to his glory. I'll sing hymns to you in the congregation. And again, what else does Jesus say? I will trust in him. Jesus becomes a man. He's born of the Virgin Mary. He becomes one of us, frail, little child right there in the manger. Grows up to be a man, preaches for three years and dies on the cross for our sins he put his faith and his trust in God. There in Gethsemane, the, day, the night before his crucifixion, when he was sweating, as it were, great drops of blood, contemplating the great suffering physically and spiritually that he would, was about to undertake when he would be nailed to a cross and shed his blood for you and me in the midst of that. What did Jesus do? He trusted in the Father. He became one of us, teaching us the path, how we trust in God as well. He trusted in the Father. And finally, the quotation in verse 13, here I am with the children God gave me. In other words, it says Jesus appears in heaven with all of us who are his children by virtue of salvation. And he says, Father, here we are. I'm here, the children whom you have given me, they are here. And it's as if Jesus says to God the Father, I'm one of them. He became what you are. Insignificant $17.15 worth of elements in your physical body minus the water and minus the air. And yet you are priceless to God. 
such that he left heaven's glory and came to this earth to become one of us so that he might die for our sins so that we might pay the penalty might not pay the penalty of our sins because he paid the penalty for our sins if he was ne- had never suffered how could he help us when we're suffering if he was never tempted like we how can he ever help us when we are tempted if he had never wept how can he dry our tears you see he is perfectly fitted out perfectly fitted by his suffering He has become one of us. He is related to us. Not only that, he rescues us. Look at verse 14. Now since the children have flesh and blood in common. You see, what do we all have in common? What do we all have in common? $17.15 worth of elements. Right? Give or take a little more, a little less fat. Right? But otherwise, what do we all have in common? Well, we've got $17.15 worth of elements. And Jesus took that human nature, and in that human nature, what did he do? He rescues us. Watch it. Since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these so that through his death he might, watch it, destroy The one who holds the power of death, that is the devil. I am so glad to see the devil get his, aren't you? I am sick and tired of all of his shenanigans. I see him at work just like you do every day. And I am glad to know that God has had it with the devil. And that God has dealt once and for all with the devil. And that Jesus, when he died on the cross, what does he do? He destroys, he disarms Satan. He takes away his power. Look at it. He might destroy the one holding the power of death. That is the devil. And not only that, he not only disarms the devil, but he delivers those of us who are slaves to the devil. Look at verse 15. And free those. Look at that freedom language. Free those who were held in slavery. Look at the slavery language. We're now free. We were held in slavery all of our lives by the fear of death. But now through the death of Christ. Why? He's one of us. He became one of us, remained who he is, became who we are, died for us, and now frees us from the fear of death. He has disarmed Satan. He has delivered the slaves. He has rescued us. For it is clear, verse 16, that he does not reach out to help the angels. They don't need any help. But rather, he's come to help Abraham's offspring. That is an idiom, a way of expressing humanity. Abraham's offspring, (laughs) humanity. He's come to help people. Those angels don't need any help. They're fine. They're doing just great. They don't need any help, but you and I do. We need help. And so he has rescued us. And finally, how does he do that? He does it by reconciling us. He's related to us. He rescues us. And now he is reckon, he reconciles us to himself. Look at verses 17 and 18. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every way. That's Christmas. That's his coming into this world to be made like you and me in every way. Fully human. Was Jesus fully human? Yes. Now, did, is he also fully divine? Yes, he's the God-man. He's not 50% God and 50% man. No, don't think of it that way. He is 100% God who becomes 100% man. He is the God-man. Isn't that remarkable? Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he could become a merciful and a faithful high priest. Now, if you were a Jewish Christian, you would understand that language. The Jews were understood what it meant to have a high priest they had they were born lived and died under the priestly system and the role of the high priest was to be a mediator in israel the high priest was a mediator between god and the people and so now we are told guess what we have a mediator 
We have a divine mediator. We have the mediator, the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is merciful. That means he knows what we experience, and therefore he's merciful. When you blow it, he understands. When you mess up, he realizes what is man, that you're mindful of him, or the son of man, $17.15. But he's a faithful high priest. He's merciful to you, and yet faithful always to God. What did he do? Look at it. He made atonement for the sins of the people. Folks, if you are saved today, you are saved because of the first Christmas and because of the cross. There is no salvation in any other way. There is no way for your sins to be dealt with. No other option, no other alternative. Only Christmas and only the cross can deal with your sin problem, which is the problem that all of us have, that each of us has. And so we are told he became a merciful and faithful high priest. What did he do? He died on the cross for our sins. Verse 18, for since he himself has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. He's one of us. If you only knew how God cares for you, if you only knew in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your difficulties, in the midst of your trials, in the midst of your problems, oh, if you only knew how much God cares for you, how much your faithful and merciful high priest, Jesus, looks upon you with tenderness today and says to you, no matter what, I became one of you. I became like you. And I died in your place so that you could be in my family. And that's why I came, Jesus says. And that's why there is Christmas. He came for the cross that he might taste death for every. Do you know him today? Those of you watching me online, do you know Christ as your Lord and Savior today? Listen, the greatest gift you can receive at Christmas time is the gift of salvation, the gift of God to you, your salvation, forgiveness of your sins, reconciliation with the God who made you. You can go from your sense of insignificance. You think you go home and you feel like I'm worth nothing. And yet God says to you, you're worth absolutely everything. I came to rescue you. You know what Christmas is? It's the great rescue mission. Christmas is God's great rescue mission to rescue you from the devil, from your sin, and to give you the gift of salvation to free you from the fears of life and death, the fear of death, and to give you eternal life. Joy, hope, meaning, purpose. That changes that $17.15 and makes you invaluable in God's eyes. That's what Christmas is all about. 